It won't be long now before you too can enjoy a view like this. Economy or business class? There will be a variety of choices of carrier and cabin. The view will be spectacular. This is the traditional way to orbit, a Russian Soyuz launched from Kazakhstan. NASA has to pay in the area of $70 million per seat return trip, and prices are about to go up. Only the Chinese have an alternative launch system. Very shortly, there will be two carriers taking tourists into space on suborbital flights. Blue Origin will probably launch first with their capsule and reusable launcher. Next will be Virgin Galactic and their suborbital space plane, launched from beneath a carrier aircraft and landing like one too, although to what altitude is still not known. Then you have America's return to space with its two commercial partners. Boeing have their CST Starliner, the first launch-capable capsule already off the assembly line. Looking every bit like an Apollo spacecraft, it will be able to ferry crew to and from the ISS. An unmanned test launch to the space station is imminent and the crew has been picked to undertake the first few missions. Their standout competitors are SpaceX and their manned Dragon capsule, performing the same vital service. They are hedging their bets in the tourist sector as well, with their BFR concept naming their first paying customer. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, everyone. Wow. I am from Japan. My name is Yusaku Maezawa. You can call me MZ, please. After the success of the Falcon Heavy maiden launch, SpaceX is ramping up design and construction of its even larger rocket ship to Mars. However, the two other commercial entities aren't resting on their launchers either. Jeff Bezos Blue Origin has developed its BE-4 engine to power an orbital delivery system, and they have the U.S. Air Force on board. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Not to be left out of the market, Virgin has also developed a small payload orbital system, Virgin Orbit with its Launcher 1.
Flown to 35,000 feet, slung beneath Cosmic Girl, a Virgin 747, the two-stage rocket can lift up to 500 kilograms into orbit and an inclination up to 120 degrees. Dream Chaser is still in the running with its pilotless shuttle, still under development for long-duration orbits. The late Microsoft founder Paul Allen's company, Strato Launch, has unveiled the largest aircraft in the world, a scaled-up airborne launch platform with multiple payloads from the existing Pegasus rocket to a medium and heavy launch vehicle and a reusable space plane in the future. In the meantime, there is no shortage of conventional launch systems competing for their share of the market. From the USA, Europe, China, India, Japan, even Israel and New Zealand. The key to any launch system is, of course, the engine. The smaller, lighter and more powerful, the better. They pose many design problems. Fuel type, reignitable, chamber pressure limits, sea level or vacuum exhaust nozzle shape. But above all, reliability and cost. This is the Avio rocket factory in Colleferro, Italy. Here, engineers are developing the carbon fiber casing for the solid propellant rocket stages of ESA's new Vega C launcher. To build them, 5,000 kilometers of carbon fiber impregnated with epoxy resin is wound around a pre made metal mandrel. This produces the very lightweight but sturdy casings for the first, second, and third stages of the Vega launcher. These casings are later fitted with an engine and loaded with solid propellant. One of these solid propulsion engines is the P120C. It was recently successfully tested in Kourou and is the largest and most powerful monolithic solid propulsion rocket ever built. With this new rocket, ESA hopes to respond to launcher market demands. The agency is also looking for value for money. This new engine is designed with the latest immersive technology and leading-edge materials and processes. Mass production will bring down the unit cost, but the design is for both Vega C and the strap-on boosters for Ariane 6. So certainly in the um, launcher sector, the competition is growing worldwide. But uh, uh, we believe that the European answer, the ESA answer with Vega C and Ariane 6 is the right answer. In an aggressive manner, we are trying to make things more and more competitive. One of these examples is the joint uh, solid rocket motor that we are developing across the two programs, the Vega C and the Ariane 6, the P120C solid rocket motor that uh, uh, enables the possibility to harmonize resources and to have the same motor serving the Vega C as a first stage as well as the Ariane 6 in both configuration as a strap-on boosters. So this is a very good uh, answer to tackle the competitiveness uh, aspect. With Vega C, the C stands for consolidation, ESA is further developing Vega. 
It will add increased performance to the flexibility of the current system without increasing the cost. Today, Vega can launch up to 1.5 tons on a 700 km orbit. With Vega C, it will go up to 2.3 tons. In order to increase performance, two new solid propulsion engines have been developed, the P120C and the Zephyro 40 for the second stage. It is clear that whatever we develop has an exploitation objective. So we do not develop uh, uh, rockets just for the fun of it, but we develop uh, rockets that need to be exploitable, therefore competitive in the worldwide market. And that's the way we are working hand in hand with industry to prepare them to uh, walk on their legs in the future throughout the exploitation uh, phase. Further enhancements are made with Avon Plus, which is derived from the current Vega's Avon upper stage. Investing in new rocket motors also means investing in new launch facilities. We have foreseen a lot of activities to modify the launch site from the Vega configuration to the Vega C configuration. Vega C is a, a heavy, large and length uh, launchers with respect to the, to the Vega one. So, uh, for this reason, we have to modify the access to the stages, increasing the diameters for what concerns the, uh, uh, the, the first stage. Other changes include modified fluid services and installation of a more powerful crane needed to lift the heavier second stage of Vega C. During these modifications, the site has to remain operational for the scheduled Vega launches. In the end, the launch site will be compatible with both launchers. With Vega C, ESA is also working on related products such as the Space Rider, based on ESA's experimental re-entry vehicle IXV. It should allow for payloads to be sent into orbit and later return to Earth. In addition to this, uh, we have other products like the, uh, a specific adapter for launching into orbit uh, small uh, uh, spacecraft, so enabling the possibility of universities and research centers to access space at limited cost. So uh, coping with the payloads which go from one kilogram up to 500 kilograms. We also have uh, early elements of uh, uh, definition for a platform called Venus, which could allow payloads to transfer from orbit to orbit. One unit which has been around for years and is still the Ferrari of rocket motors is the Space Shuttle main engine. Four of them will be mounted on the long-awaited space launch system. Reusing proven shuttle technology has saved time and money. The solid rocket boosters have been extended and tested. The Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-25 motors continue to roll off the assembly line. Fabrication of the immense components, cryogenic tanks, intertanks and fairings continues. The Orion capsule has flown once, the second flight-ready capsule is being prepared for the grand show.
There is one more critical piece of kit required, perhaps one of the most important sections for keeping the astronauts alive, the service module. At Airbus in Europe, they have delivered the first flight-ready unit for the launch. The European component will house the electrical power, life support and propulsion unit for the Orion spacecraft, and like a giant pocket watch, every component is carefully and painstakingly assembled. The European service module is part of uh, an entire spacecraft built by an American company, Lockheed Martin, um, under the contract of NASA, and we are part of that, and of that spacecraft, uh, NASA Lockheed Martin is building. We are providing the European service module. We are providing the powerhouse of that entire spacecraft. That means we are providing the propulsion system, so the thrust um, to get into into the dedicated orbit we would like to fly with the spacecraft. We are providing the air condition, I'm saying. That's the thermal control system of the entire spacecraft. We take care of the heat which has been generated in the capsule, which has been generated out of several electronic components in the European service module as well. And uh, we are making sure that that heat get radiated into the outside of that spacecraft. On top of this, we are generating power um, our solar array wings are producing that power. We are conditioning that power and deliver that to the crew module uh, and deliver that to the batteries with it, which are located inside the crew module. And finally, we are also providing what the astronaut need to have to live uh, in that spacecraft. That's mainly water in terms of the consumables and that's oxygen and nitrogen to generate the atmosphere and the crew module itself. On the power side, we are proud that we have installed uh, hardware which has already been flown several years ago on a shuttle. So the big engine we are flying here, the OMS-E, uh, was a challenge for us to bring that into the vehicle. This is not new technology in that sense, but the, the integration itself, that, that was really for us a challenge that was new. We're preparing ourselves to be ready for the final integration with the rest of the vehicle, and then we are ready for a test campaign in the US, which is including several environmental tests, several functional tests, uh, that last couple of months. Uh, up to that point where the NASA team is handing over the spacecraft uh, to GSDO, to the launch campaign, so that the vehicle can be put onto the launcher and then we are ready for flight. The first engine is the big engine which is coming from the space shuttle. With this big engine, we performed the big transition maneuver to go to the moon or to go back to, uh, to the Earth. So we can see here the auxiliary thruster, which are red. We have eight of them coming from Aerojet. Here we have the OMSE, so the main engine, but without the nozzle which will be integrated in one of the latest integration steps. 
we can see here the propellant tanks. We have four of them, two for each propellant. ATV, basically, the automated transport vehicle here in Europe, played a role, a significant role, in terms of opening the door uh, for that specific joint work on that spacecraft. Uh, it also played a role that we learned our lessons uh, with a kind of that service module. Finally, the components we have flown on ATV, there are not so many which, which we carry on in, in, in the Orion European service module. We have a couple of them, uh, mainly auxiliary thrusters, yes, on the RCS thrusters, and uh, also a couple of tanks like our pressure and tanks, but there are not just a few items which we carry on from ATV into the European service module design. The difficulty here for the human spaceflight is the change of uh, mindset. So to think that we are here in this space mission, we are flying human, and it's not like uh, a rocket which is only flying with a satellite. Therefore, we are putting more effort on the safety aspect. We have a lot of redundancy. Each change we introduce, the smallest change we introduce in our system has to go through the safety safety board, our safety board is a safety board and then the program safety board to be sure that we can uh, bring the crew back home safe. With Orion and the service module certified, the sky won't be the limit. We will see ships refueling in orbit, a gateway station with a return to the moon, then on to Mars and beyond. Opening space to industry and exploration, spaceflight will become the norm rather than the exception. Mining and manufacturing in orbit, power production and habitats. One day, it might be as easy as driving to work in that red convertible of yours. Brute force at work. A European Ariane 5 rocket lifts off from Kourou. For Bepi Colombo, Europe's first mission to Mercury, the real journey has begun. Its seven and a half year flight is a major challenge in orbital mechanics and will see it reach the smallest and innermost planet in our solar system in 2025. There, its discovery mission will really begin. A joint program with the Japanese space agency JAXA, Pepe Colombo is one of the most complex scientific missions ever launched. It carries two orbiters designed to unravel many of Mercury's mysteries. These include an unusual magnetic field strange surface features called hollows, and ancient ice hidden in polar craters. Frank spacecraft is provided by ESA, 
which is uh, MPO, we call it MPO, Mercury Planetary Orbiter. And this spacecraft has a focus more on the planet. We want to observe the planet, do remote sensing, characterize the surface, ground the cra uh, craters, wanting to know about the composition of the surface, the interior of that planet. And in addition, we have a second spacecraft, and this spacecraft is called the Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter, more focused on the environment, and this spacecraft is uh, provided by the Japanese Space Agency. We know the Mercury is very hot, and uh, we have to make uh, the satellite that can survive in that harsh environment. And we know, well, it is very difficult, and uh, we started, when we started, the, we already some development, and we think that we can do it. But actually, the hurdle is much higher, harder than we expected, and takes a long time. But now, you see, the, this is the flight model. Bepi Colombo's road, design, research, and development phase, the construction, assembly, and testing phase, has been long and hard, culminating in the launch from the European spaceport in French Guiana. Mercury is three times closer to the sun, and therefore the radiation or the uh, heat which we are getting from Mercury is ten times higher. So everything which we had to develop had to withstand the higher temperatures, but also the higher radiation doses which we got from the solar wind. And for that we need special insulation of our spacecraft, special materials to be developed for the antenna, for the solar panels. And uh, yeah, that uh, was a very big challenge for the mission in itself. Now, of course, we do the health checks to verify the system is healthy. And we did alignment, mechanical checks, electrical checks all over. We checked the propulsion subsystems uh, to see if the propulsion elements are still leak tight in preparation for the fueling. Hardware apart, training of the scientists and technicians back on Earth was extensive, requiring years of preparation. campaign is the first time that all the experts involved in the Bepi Colombo spacecraft design, integration, testing and operations work together as a single team. The campaign is essential for this group to learn to work as a single team, to train the decision-making process. The campaign is also very important for us to fine-tune our plans and procedures. It's the first time that we exercise the flight plans and procedures in a realistic context taking into account communication constraints, ground station, and timing. In preparing for a mission like this, we have to carefully train all the aspects. Uh, what we actually do in the rehearsal, we do in preparation of a launch, we train the teams to work together, we train the teams to work with the flight procedures, and also we train the, team as the teams as much as we can in flight conditions. So normally when we test before, we test with many workarounds. What we try to simulate here is actually to replicate as much as possible flight condition. And we typically do between 20 and 30 of these rehearsal before a flight. With the nail-biting launch sequence complete, for many it's time to sit back and wait. The cruise will be bit above seven years. We will fly by once the Earth, two times um, Venus and six times Mercury itself. Before we come into the orbit, which allows us to capture with the small gravity of planet Mercury against the big sun. That means when we fly, we constantly break against the sun because we fly into the inner side of our solar system. Yeah, and then when you fly towards the most heaviest element there, you constantly accelerate. We don't want that. That's why we decelerate. Because this planet is so close to the sun, you need to have a lot of energy to go there. It's even easier to send a spacecraft to Pluto than to Mercury. You have to break until the gravity of the sun and you need a lot of energy. And for that reason our mission takes quite a long time uh, because we also need the help of planetary flybys in order to bring our spacecraft there. 
then we want to send two spacecraft in an orbit around Mercury. And that in itself is also a problem because on the other hand, you need to break against the sun, but on the other hand, you also need to accelerate your spacecraft to bring it in the same speed as Mercury goes around the sun and then to finally drop it into an orbit uh, of the planet. I'm working now 14 years on this mission, so it's, it's really like yeah, a baby growing up and then leaving the house finally. So for, for, for me, it's a special moment. Bepi Colombo's main component parts are two orbiters and one transfer module. These took four weeks to disassemble and pack and required 70 shipping containers and four cargo planes to ensure safe delivery to the European spaceport at Kourou. Spacecraft have got up close and personal with Mercury twice before, thanks to NASA's Mariner 10 probe and, some 40 years later, the MESSENGER mission. MESSENGER mapped the surface and identified strong evidence for water ice in shaded craters. But its mission also raised new questions about this mysterious planet. This latest probe has a sophisticated suite of sensors and instruments that will come into play when it reaches orbit around Mercury. So the, the big step forward for Bepi Colombo is the fact that we have two spacecraft, the European Space Agency spacecraft, which is looking um, directly designed to look at the surface of the planet and to study the planet in detail. Uh, and the orbit is designed such that you maximize uh, the objectives that you can do relating to the surface. And the second spacecraft um, is designed to look at the environment. And so having two spacecraft will enable us to do um, a great deal of new science compared to the previous missions. Bepi Colombo with a two satellite approach. We have one satellite, the MMO, sitting in the solar wind, and the other one is inside the, uh, the magnetosphere. So we can see what is coming towards the magnetosphere and what is driving changes within the magnetosphere. We have 11 instruments on board the spacecraft, and when we are at Mercury, these instruments are gathering data and then they will store it in effectively a large hard drive which we have on board the spacecraft. That data is then um, collected over a, a number of hours. And when we um, have a visibility with the spacecraft uh, in Mercury, typically it's every 16 hours we can talk to the spacecraft at Mercury. The data is then uh, downlinked using um, uh, a very large high gain antenna. It's a very powerful antenna in order to have a, a data rate of about 340 kilobits per second. If you compare it to your home internet, this is nothing. It's a very slow data rate but it's very fast considering we are very close to the sun and we might get some interference from the energy from the sun. So it's, it's as powerful as we can have with the resources we have on board the spacecraft. With the assistance of gravity flybys, the spacecraft will rely on its solar electric propulsion system. It consists of four TX ion thrusters, fueled with xenon gas that is ionized and electrically propelled out, providing thrust for months at a time. The thrusters will rely on the spacecraft's solar arrays for power. The T6 thrusters can accelerate Bepi Colombo 15 times more efficiently than a conventional chemical thruster. So at Earth, um, the solar flux is 1.4, more or less 1.4 kilowatts per square meter. As we approach Mercury, which is the most innermost planet of the solar system, that solar flux has risen 10 times. So now we have 14 kilowatts per square meter. Now you might think that's a good thing in the sense that it gives you more energy to turn into electricity to be able to run your thrusters. 
But it turns out that that immense flux that we're getting from the sun also drives the temperature of the spacecraft very high. And in particular, our solar arrays, which are sensitive to high temperature, need to be protected. Now, we do that in a number of different ways. We keep as much of the open surface covered in little mirrors that we call OSRs, optical surface reflectors, or with specially developed white coatings, which help to um, reject the heat from the sun. But perhaps the, the biggest uh, mechanism that we use to keep the solar ray cool is to off point. Rather than pointing the solar rays directly to the sun, we point them at a very shallow angle. And what that does is it means it keeps the thermal energies under control while still giving us the necessary energy to turn into electric uh, power for the thrusters. Now, the reason why the solar rays are so big is because we're off pointing by so much that in order to get a sufficient um, cross section of the solar array, the solar array needs to be big. Protected by multi layered insulation, hand stitched thermal blankets, and a radiator to dissipate heat, ESA's Mercury Planetary Orbiter will have to cope with extreme environments. If a unit is getting too hot, if one of the payloads is getting too hot, in order to stop that payload from being damaged, we'll switch it off. We'll send an emergency message back to, back to the Earth, reporting that there's an issue. We need, to, uh, we need ESOC to take action, to investigate why items are getting too hot, and then uh, to, recover the, uh, to recover the unit and the spacecraft. Once they reach Mercury in late 2025, the orbiters will separate from the transfer module to begin their comprehensive scientific mission in 2026. In principle, all the planets have the same chemical elements because the whole solar system has the same chemical composition, but it, it's distributed differently in different planets and, and, and different environments. So, so uh, the, 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 it is vital to understand what is the ratio of the abundances of different elements to understand the structure of the, of the surface of Mercury. One of the advanced sensors aboard Bepi Colombo is a sensitive imaging X-ray spectrometer called MIX, which produces a global map of Mercury's surface atomic composition at high spatial resolution. The MIX instrument, the Mercury Imaging spe X-ray Spectrometer, looks at the fluorescence that um, happens when the sun shines on, on Mercury in X-rays. So it's a bit like when you, you, you wear a shirt in party lights, which has been washed in the right sort of washing powder, and the party lights shine on your shirt and your shirt glows. Uh, and it's exactly the same with the sun and Mercury. The sun shines on the, uh, on the surface in X-rays, and the surface of Mercury glows in X-rays, and if you detect those X-rays, you can tell what Mercury is made of. And what it tells you, you're actually counting the atoms on the surface. So it tells you in a very quantitative way exactly what the surface layer of Mercury is made of. So I would say one of the most exciting things about MIX is the fact that we will be able to produce the first um, images in X-ray wavelengths of Mercury's surface and that is going to be able to give us um, a great deal of new information both on a, a global scale and on a local scale of how the composition of Mercury varies um, over its entirety of its surface. Um, another aspect of the mix science which um, I'm personally very excited about is the fact that we can also see X-rays from the surface which are being produced by particles from Mercury's magnetosphere actually precipitating onto the surface and producing X-rays that we will be able to also measure. So we can have a, an extra ac aspect to the science that we can do uh, relating to how Mercury's magnetosphere interacts with the surface. Among the mysteries revealed by MESSENGER are irregularly shaped depressions known as hollows, found in clusters over a wide range of latitudes and longitudes. 
These hollows have bright interiors and halos with a fresh appearance that suggests they are geologically very young. I think that there are two uh, mystery or two uh, very intriguing objectives of uh, Bepi Colombo. The first one uh, are, um, are the olives. The olives are features discovered by messenger. These features uh, seem to be quite distributed all over the surface the, of Mercury and uh, is something related to the volatile that uh, come to the surface after an impact, after a volcanic event. But of course we need Bepi Colombo to really characterize it, to understand which is the origin of the olives. There are also clear traces of much more recent hollows where the surface has been eaten away by some process that removed solid volatile substances such as sulfur, chlorine, sodium and potassium as vapor. And this is because we don't have the composition data. We have seen, we can measure the dimension, the size of the hollows, we can have an idea of the distribution, but uh, no more. And also, of course, uh, Messenger didn't get so many high-resolution images and uh, didn't have high, uh, the digital terrain model, the 3D images at, at high resolution, as we will provide on its symbiosis. In other words, I think that all of, the olives are one of the most uh, interesting discovery made by Messenger. Existing evidence indicates that if combined and spread out over a city the size of, say, Washington, the amount of water ice concealed in Mercury's polar craters would be over two miles thick. And the second point uh, is the water, because uh, even Messenger said, uh, yes, on the polar region we may have some water ice uh, hidden just in the shadow of the craters because in the polar region there are some floor of the craters, some wall of the craters that are not, that are always in shadow, as occur on the moon. But the messenger didn't have the instrument to, to, um, to uh, observe if it is, to make a, a direct measurement of water, has occurred on the moon. And Bepi Colombo and Symbiosis will be able to do it with uh, our spectrograph. If confirmed by Bepi Colombo, the story of how the inner planets, including Earth, acquired water and some of the chemical building blocks for life becomes much clearer. It would support the theory that organic compounds as well as water were delivered from the outer solar system to the inner planets and may have led to prebiotic chemical synthesis and, as a consequence, life on Earth. So studying Mercury is crucial to better understand the formation of our solar system, how Earth is formed and evolved and where we are coming from. So Mercury is in a way a missing piece in the big puzzle of the formation of the solar system and a crucial end member because it's close to the sun and if you want to get this full picture you have to look at the planet close to the sun as we also did in future, uh, past missions that we were looking at the comets or planets further out. We all have our individual science objectives for each of our instruments and what we're starting to do now is to bring all of our ideas together which obviously are complementary to each other and we can start to form uh, a, a broader set of goals at 
working group level, so the surface working group and the environment working group, and that helps us to, again, maximise the science that we can get from the mission by coordinating what it is that we want to do, uh, potentially looking at specific targets on the surface and that, and that kind of thing. We can work together to, to get the best from, from the mission that we possibly can. ESA science and engineering teams have already been working on Bepi Colombo for more than a decade. But with a long journey ahead of it, the recent launch marks only the beginning of the next intriguing stage of Bepi Colombo's voyage of discovery.